he was depressed by the fact, but he didn't see any alternative. He believed that his countrymen were irretrievably racist and that um, out of justice to the black man, newly freed, um, the United States owed them a place of refuge. And his idea was to buy the Dominican Republic. Uh, displaying a caustic wit for which he was little credited, Grant called Senator Sumner, quote, a narrow head. His eyes are so close together he can peek through a gimlet hole without blinking. <laughs> On another occasion, informed that Sumner didn't agree with the Bible, Grant replied that's because he didn't write it. <laughs> hmm. Publicly acknowledging the racism of his countrymen, Grant played a key role in enactment of the 15th Amendment and the 1875 Civil Rights Act. He did not hesitate to employ federal troops to suppress the Ku Klux Klan and other instruments of Southern terror against newly enfranchised freedmen. History has tended to blame his successor for the so-called bargain of 1877, under which federal troops were withdrawn from the South in exchange for peaceful acquiescence in the election of Rutherford B. Hayes. In fact, by the time Hayes took office, only two southern states remained under the control of Republican regimes committed to black equality. In withdrawing federal troops from South Carolina and Louisiana, Hayes merely nailed the barn door shut long after the horse had escaped. It was Grant, ordinarily a master equestrian, who had let the horse out of the barn. General Grant apologized in his final State of the Union address saying he meant well, and after all, he wasn't a professional politician, as if that would excuse everything. He then went on, um, he decided to run for a third term in 1880. He did something very smart. He left the country um, and spent the next two years on a round-the-world tour being lionized, hoping that people with short memories um, would forget that and, and would take great pride in the fact that Grant was being hailed by Queen Victoria and everyone. Um, he also displayed, this, he had a delightful, wry sense of humor. Um, he famously mocked his own lack of cultural pretensions, saying he only knew two, two tunes. One was Yankee Doodle and the other wasn't. Um, he also said, he went to Venice and uh, he said it'd be, a great, it'd be a great town if someone would only drain all those canals. Um, in any event, it'd be hard to imagine a less favorable circumstance for any new president than the sullen, bitterly divided nation that inaugurated Hayes on March 4, 1877. Many Democrats boycotted the ceremony, protesting the methods used to secure Hayes' victory over their candidate, Governor Samuel J. Tilden of New York. Critics openly mocked Hayes as his fraudulency. Not since 1825, when John Quincy Adams was elected by the House of Representatives, following allegations of a corrupt bargain involving the sale of the State Department, had presidential legitimacy been so in doubt. And Adams, one term, had been a train wreck of embarrassments. That is the word, I think, to keep in mind. There are presidents, four, I guess you could say, beginning with John Quincy Adams, um, certainly Hayes, Benjamin Harrison, and George W. Bush, all of whom lost the popular vote, and yet, were constitutionally elected president. And over each, a cloud of legitimacy hung. And it's fascinating to see how each, in effect, established or failed to establish uh, their legitimacy. Um, John Quincy Adams is remembered today largely for his post-presidential career. And thank you, Steven Spielberg, you know, uh, for reminding us that Adams was well ahead of his time in his opposition to slavery. Uh, Benjamin Harrison isn't remembered by anyone today, um, but uh, that's another story. Um, and then there's Hayes. Uh, to Henry Adams, the new president was, quote, a third-rate non-entity whose only recommendation is that he is obnoxious to no one. But appearances were deceiving. In his letter formally accepting the Republican nomination, Ohio's three-term governor called for an overhaul of the nation's notoriously corrupt civil service. The reform should be thorough, radical, and complete, said Hayes. Even more stunning was his pledge to serve a single four-year term. He's the last president to make that promise. 
And indeed, before he, in his last speech as president, he recommended a constitutional amendment for a single six-year term as president. Interesting idea. Just as a century later, it took the veteran anti-communist Richard Nixon to open China, so it fell to Hayes, the amiable career politician from the Republican heartland, to plead the cause of political reform. As President Hayes would have need of all his political gifts, the House was in Democratic hands for his entire term, the Senate for the second half. In fact, congressional contempt toward the executive was bipartisan. On the other hand, there's nothing like the White House to cause even a lifelong legislator to shed his belief in legislative supremacy. Hayes killed an act passed by Congress to restrict Chinese immigration. The president vetoed seven successive appropriation bills to which his former colleagues had attached unacceptable conditions. Having named a cabinet in which ability counted for more than cronyism, early in his term, Hayes issued an executive order forbidding all federal office holders from managing party politics. In his words, quote, party leaders should have no more influence in appointments than other equally respectable citizens. Hopefully he could do better than that. <clears throat> No less committed to the reform agenda was the first lady. Now, lightning may or may not strike twice, but don't tell me that history never repeats itself. If you doubt my word, just imagine a polarizing woman deemed by her critics to be overeducated, excessively opinionated, and far too influential in her unelected position. A strong-willed social reformer and deft political operator, she hailed from a long line of fiery crusaders and for all her attention to the social amenities, whether inaugurating the White House Easter egg roll or launching a short-lived fad with her ornamental hair combs, her real objective was nothing less than to redefine the traditional role of women in America. Her name was Lucy Webb Hayes. And far from the blue-stocking lemonade Lucy of popular legend, Mrs. Rutherford B. Hayes was a feminist heroine, the most popular and reviled first lady until Eleanor Roosevelt. Her, in her words, woman's mind is as strong as man's, equal in all things, and superior in some. Born in 1831, Lucy lost her father, an Ohio doctor, when she was two. Family tradition supplied his place. The Webbs came from a long line of reformers, equally fervent in their advocacy of public education, temperance, and the abolition of slavery. At the Wesleyan Female College in Cincinnati, she is, by the way, the first first lady to get a college degree. Lucy studied rhetoric, geometry, and moral sciences. She developed an early, very unladylike interest in politics. When the Civil War broke out and her lawyer husband joined Ohio's Fighting 23rd Regiment, Lucy said she wished she could raise a battalion of women to serve the Union cause at Fort Sumter. Another field of action opened during her husband's governorship. Despite giving birth to eight children in 20 years, she maintained a lively interest in public affairs, visiting state prisons and mental hospitals, and raising funds to construct a facility for war orphans. In the White House, Lucy proved an outspoken supporter of votes for women, to which radical viewpoint she converted the man she called Rudd 40 years in advance of their countrymen. Outraged that the unfinished Washington Monument should disfigure the capital name for the first president, Mrs. Hayes convinced her husband to secure a congressional appropriation with which to complete the job. Himself a devotee of Ralph Waldo Emerson, who attended church services mostly to please his devout wife, when asked his sectarian preferences, President Hayes declared himself close to Methodism since he swept every night with one of that persuasion. The First Lady's far-flung campaign for temperance won her millions of fans and more than a few detractors. Sniffed the Boston Post, Mr. Hayes will, during the absence of Mrs. Hayes, be acting president. <laughs> According to the acerbic Mrs. Henry Adams, Lucy was, quote, quite nice looking, dark with smooth black hair, combed low over the ears and a high comb behind. Her dress a plain, untrimmed black silk, a broad white Smyrna lace tie around her neck. No jewelry. 